Well, with great pleasure. I'd like to introduce my friend Paul. Paul has, Paul has uh, done so much in the world of mushrooms, and he's so knowledgeable, and uh, both from the folk side and from all kinds of different sides, he brings such a different, interesting perspective to to mushrooms, and this one actually, I think uh, I've been really looking forward to listening to it ever since he told me he had it. So, with that, Paul from the Vancouver Mycological Society, president for years on and off, they get you, drag you back in, and you're, you're out, out, but they drag back in. <laughs> and uh, working with the UBC Herbarium. And, and he's got a book on it. Yeah, and they've got a book out. Exactly, that's right. The Outer Spores, Mushrooms of Fighting Wine. Yeah, we've got it here, and uh, yeah, good book, and it's uh, a very good the author to sign it. As oh, I mentioned, yeah. we got another author over here with some of his books, Robert. And uh, so, thanks for all the care. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, well, this is about the dark side of mushrooming, poisonings. And um, we've heard of. Uh, Santa's elves that live in the north and labor all year long to produce gifts for good children. And it's somewhat ironic, the German word for poison is gift, as in gift pilts or poisonous mushrooms. So I got that got me thinking about Darwin's elves who are out there all over the place just waiting to select naturally those that shall continue to mushroom. <laughs> and um, I went, I wanted, with that idea, I went searching for a mushroom elf and I found a delightful one. And to my great shock, the first time I put this in on as a slideshow, I discovered it was animated. <laughs> it came in at the start when I first saw it. I had no idea it was a little bit. No. Well, and uh, I'd like to thank um, these people credited with photos here want to thank them. And uh, also, I stole lots of stuff from the internet when necessary, but only when necessary. <laughs> and I give the internet a great review. Uh, it's a great place to steal photos, because for legal use, you can use photos if it's for review purposes. So that's my review. <laughs> so, anyway, I'll now proceed with this. Uh... OK, now. <laughs> One of the classic questions that mushroomers get is, how can you tell an edible mushroom from a poisonous mushroom? And there's no real simple rule other than if you feed it to a lawyer and you get a lawsuit, it just might be poisonous. Right? So, uh, but, or, you know, there's various other versions of that. But, so there's all these folk myths. So poisonous mushrooms don't turn silver black. And in fact, you can boil up the deadliest mushrooms with silver and they won't turn it black. Um, poisonous mushrooms don't turn to rice, onions, garlic, etc. a particular color. Um, in fact, some mushrooms are great for coloring dishes. Or, uh, uh, there's this saying that if, oh, if, it, if you can peel it, it's edible. Well, I've tried peeling some deadly mushrooms and it works just great. <laughs> Poisonous mushrooms are all different. There's no particular odor, texture, odor, taste, etc. that indicates that mushrooms are safe or poisonous. Uh, it's a whole bunch of things. There's uh, many habitats they grow in. Some folk myths say if it grows in a meadow, it's edible. If it's on the road, it's not. The place uh, it's all sorts of examples of different poisonous mushrooms in different habitats. And of course, there's a saying, if, if a lot of people believe that if a mushroom has been eaten by an animal, it is edible. A lot of animals can eat things that we can't eat. And as you'll see soon, a lot of mushroom poisons take a long time to take effect. So you should be willing to follow a squirrel or a deer around for a number of days to make sure that they're OK. <laughs> and poisons do take out animals. Now there's general safety concerns about eating mushrooms. A lot of the so-called mushroom poisonings are actually from other causes other than poisons that are contained in the mushroom, naturally. And uh, so 
there's spoilage. Sometimes people get a bit goofy with wild mushrooms and they'll treat them in far poorer ways than any other type of edibles. They'll eat mushrooms in far worse shape than they would vegetables or meat or fish. Um, you should be wary of where you collect them, make sure it's pristine habitat. There are lots of sources for illness and morbidity from um, contamination, either chemical or bacteriological, biological. So um, there's agricultural chemicals, petroleum products, heavy metals, all these things should be of concern. And so if it's in urban areas, you know, uh, agricultural, industrial areas, and unfortunately, quite often, dog dew and such can be along in parks and public walkways and paths. So you always have to should be aware of whether the stuff is contaminated biologically. Uh, you should always cook mushrooms thoroughly. And there are certain mushroom species that are supposed to be much better, lightly cooked or not cooked. But as a rule, it's always good to cook them thoroughly. And this can be because we can't digest mushrooms very well. We don't have chitinase naturally. Um, so you break down chitin, a structural component of fungi. And um, so you don't derive nutrition or taste or a lot of things from mushrooms if they're not thoroughly cooked. And it also helps to decontaminate them should they have biological contamination. And uh, many mushrooms are edible when they're well cooked, but not if they're raw. There's a lot of compounds that are unstable, that are deleterious to our health and well-being. But if you cook the mushrooms, it's driven off. And uh, they're broken down. And a classic example is true morels. They're poisonous when they're raw, but they're fine when they're cooked. Uh, eat mushrooms in moderation. Uh, a lot of problems people get into is from pigging out on mushrooms. And there's things, uh, I guess we could coin the term mycobezoar, where you get obstruction. If you wolf down frying pans full of some kind of edible mushroom, you can end up with a blockage of the gut, so to speak. Or something that's very important is many mushrooms contain antibiotic compounds. And in small amounts, this might not affect you, but if you pick out a lot of mushrooms, you may well disrupt the natural gut flora in your body. So you'll get the runs and a bit of cramping, and that's from the disruption of the gut flora. So I recommend if, if you eat a lot of certain types of mushrooms and you find yourself getting all loosened up and such, you may want to scarf down something cultured, the probiotic thing, your yogurt, or something like that to uh, try to get the gut flora sort of you know, back into some kind of activity. And um, also, there's just plain allergies. And a lot of people believe that allergies are something that just exists in you. But you develop allergies through repeated exposure to things. And even after a long time of taking in something, your body can suddenly produce an immune response to it. And uh, so for this reason, if you um, are eating certain mushrooms and one mushroom all of a sudden gets you one day and, oh, it might be bacterial contamination, it might be something else, but if you try it again and that happens once again, you may well have developed a sensitivity to that mushroom. That happened to me with bullies. Is that one? Yeah. For you. Yeah. And I'll discuss that a bit more future in this presentation. And that's, uh, there's also been people that have developed uh, severe allergies to morels after enjoying them for years. <laughs> and there's other examples um, anecdotally there. Now, there are many different types of mushroom poisonings. All sorts of different chemical compounds are in, produced by large fungi that we attempt to eat. And it has a great spectrum, a great range of complexity of molecular structure and different effects, different organs that it'll affect or different overall uh, impact of eating these things. Uh, there are several really major types, well-known types, which are the classic uh, groups of mushroom poisoning. In many presentations, like the mushroom poisoning posters that the Edmonton Club produced um, use these categories. So I will deal with that ranging from some of the most alarming to 
some mild ones. Um, there is a general rule in naturally occurring biotoxins, uh, toxins from plants, animals, fungi, that the longer the latency period, the longer it takes for the symptoms to emerge, the more serious the type of poisoning. And this is generally because a lot of naturally occurring toxins, they're very serious to our particular organ systems. It takes them a while to get chugging away and doing their insidious work through various mechanisms. So uh, quite often, um, if you get really short um, uptake of your symptoms, like your classic example is nausea, vomiting after eating mushrooms within an hour. Uh, generally, that's just going to be a simply resolved gastrointestinal issue. If it is 12 hours or longer and you begin to get really sick, that is an alarm signal and attention should be sought, uh, particularly and rigorously if it's late on set. Um, so severe. Uh, by, by, of course, with the slow-acting toxins, you've already absorbed them. They're distributed through the body, the circulatory system, whatever, the various tissues. And they're undertaking their damage, and um, treatment is very difficult. Elimination of the toxin from you at that point is very difficult. And uh, severe damage occurs to organs such as liver, kidneys, and death may be likely in many cases. Uh, here we have short uptake of symptoms, generally fairly positive. And we have this a classic gastrointestinal upset that resolves itself within a few hours. Um, generally, if we, a lot of this involves vomiting and diarrhea, and the body essentially purges itself of the offensive material. And then if you've lost a lot of fluid and electrolytes, you just want to you know, replace that and rest because you probably had a workout, you know, the GI workout as we call it. <laughs> so, um, and so when poisonings occur, when it's looked at uh, how to proceed, generally it's all based on the symptoms the patient is experiencing. And hospitals and clinics and doctors, uh, vets, etc., like to know what the offending mushroom is. Uh, they want to get it identified, but they are working at dealing with the actual symptoms as they're appearing and doing supportive and symptomatic treatment. And uh, I am the point person for BC for uh, mushroom poisonings. And so quite often material is sent to me for identification of poisoning. And some of the, so I'll give a couple of case uh, examples here eventually. So the complexity of chemicals involved varies greatly, and there's uh, the really serious class of really scary uh, cyclopeptide poisoning, the deadly amanita poisoning, uh, is caused by an enormously complicated molecule, uh, molecular structures that form these, they're called poly polycyclic peptides, and they form these big rings of, of nucleic acids and configurations, then they can bond together these rings into larger aggregates around sugar molecules, and this whole big, messy, complex thing is in the mushroom, and you eat it, and the thing disaggregates and circulates around, and then eventually glues itself back together around sugar molecules in your gut, or in your liver, or wherever, and then this thing starts attacking that. There's a long uptake before the first symptoms occur with very complex molecules. And there's some really just dead simple things like these mono, uh, mono, monomethyl hydrazines are really simple molecules that are um, remarkably simple for something that causes harm. Um, then we should remember cyanide is an extremely simple molecule, which is a well known cause. Uh, so we have these different mushroom groups. So there's the very complex deadly cyclopeptides that are found in the deadly amanitas, like uh, phylloides and verosa, the destroying angel and death cat. And um, they're found in certain canosity, little tiny brown canosities with rings on the stems, gallerinas, like gallerina autumnalis. Uh, Lepiota species, a lot of little small lepiotas contain the deadly cyclopeptides. 
Orolanin is a different um, form of toxin. So the uh, deadly cyclopeptides attack the liver primarily and actually cause an exodus of, of elements out of the liver cells. And you can see in photomicrographs of liver tissue that the, each cell is grossly damaged and crumpled up and collapsed. And, um, and this long duration of uptake up to 72 hours before the first symptom. They go through a crisis period and it's all. So Oralanin is an even longer 36 hours to 21 days before the first symptoms. I'd ask you all to reflect on what you had to eat exactly three weeks ago. And you might understand that it took a long time before there was realized that there's a group of mushrooms that cause kidney destruction, absolute kidney destruction, irreversible, uh, with this huge delay period. Uh, gyromitrin, we just got a gyromitra, inf gyromitra infula in today, and a um, great example of a poisonous mushroom. And that's uh, something that um, is interesting because it is a volatile compound that can be driven off Coprene is in inky caps and in combination with alcohol that causes illness. Uh, there's some psychoactive <coughs> muscarine causes sweating. I call it, um, it causes perspiration, salivation, lacrimation. So I call it drool, sweat, and tears. <laughs> it's, um, in quite a few species of platosity, just a lot of inosity species, some I see this. Ibotenic acid, muscimol, and psychoactives are delirium or um, euphoriant uh, compounds uh, that are in amanita mysteria, amanita pantherina, and a few other amanitas. Psilocybin, psilocin are the classic magic mushroom compounds, true hallucinogens. Uh, gastrointestinal irritants, or as a whole range of things, which I lump in melting pot of things that cause us usually rapid onset, gastrointestinal diarrhea, cramping, nausea, and, uh, vomiting, weakness, uh, abdominal cramps, uh, and usually resolves um, through a whole bunch of different mushrooms. This is the most common, commonly encountered group of actual mushroom poisons. They're caused by actual toxins in mushrooms. And there's a few ones that are, uh, yeah, I've said just a few more. I'm going Smithiana, sometimes it's mistaken for pine mushroom. And it causes kidney failure that is temporarily, temporary and usually recovers. For, recovery is fairly complete. But quite often a patient will just spend some time on dialysis and then everything restores itself. And they go along and do great, but tend not to eat a lot of would be pine mushrooms. <laughs> Very unpleasant, but not fatal yet for anybody. Paxillus and gluteus is insidious. Repeated ingestion of certain paxillus, what we assume are involutus, but there may be several species involved, will cause an autoimmune reaction, uh, causing uh, acute um, anemia from your white blood cells attacking the red blood cells. And so you go into a period of acute anemia, and this usually occurs after a few exposures. And it's the only type of mushroom poisoning to have killed a professional mycologist. Perhaps not that good a professional. I was actually <laughs> considered a very good professional mycologist, but like many professional mycologists, he didn't know how to identify edible mushrooms. He just knew the Latin names for it. <laughs> and then uh, there's some things that are um, edible, but can kill you and make you sick. They are what I call the poisonous edibles. Uh, the dipper is sulfurous if they're old, they're undercooked, growing on certain trees. Uh, they can cause gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, Morale is poisonous when they're raw, uh, much to uh, somebody's chagrin. There was a banquet held for um, 
thank you is the least chief one retirement banquet and uh, the hotel that held the banquet poisoned a lot of the people at the banquet by serving raw morals including the from the provincial health officer <laughs> clear sabora origins is a bit alarming uh, there are older japanese men who had history of um, who, who had kidney disease and were on dialysis and several of them got extremely sick and some died from a um, uh, type of uh, uh, brain um, uh, encephalopathy, uh, da damage to the brain. Uh, <coughs> the angel wings. Oh. Yeah. And then uh, Trey Glome Quest, very infamous incident uh, in France in a bumper year. There were several deaths reported in France from people that ate many meals a day for several days in a row of the man on horseback, the tracheoma, the uh, flavor virus. So this is just a range of the types of mushroom poisoning. I'm just going to quickly go through the different groups. And uh, so the most deadly, most uh, lethal, the one that causes the most uh, deaths are the cyclopeptides, especially the death cap mushroom, Amanita phylloides. Here we have the cyclopeptide compound, the uh, Amanita. And Amanita phylloides popped up in uh, San Fran, California back in the 30s, I think it was 40s, presumed imported or even 20s, imported with trees from Europe. And it's been on the spread since, and it popped up in Vancouver in 1997, I think it was. And we found it for the first time in the Fraser Valley under um, sweet chestnut trees in the Fraser Valley, and then shortly afterwards it was found somewhat nearby under hazelnut, European hazelnut, and it's since been found in Vancouver, um, in sites all around where I live in Vancouver, um, and there's several types of trees including, uh, all street imported alien street trees or garden trees. Uh, Victoria, there's been a lot of it showing up in the uh, southern Vancouver Island area always under imported trees. We've had several poisonings in BC already from it. We had one fatality that turned out the person had been visiting in California, ate the mushrooms in California, traveled back to Vancouver, became sick and died in Vancouver from California mushroom poisoning. So beware, if you travel to California, don't eat California. <laughs> and then get back to Canada really quick because the health care is a lot. If you like your relatives, if you like your um, surviving relatives, you probably want them to have you die in Canada. Uh, anyway, so and anyway, these are expected to be on the spread. And there's something which is quite alarming, which I discovered talking to the city arborist in Vancouver. Um, I found out that all the trees that they've been growing under were bought by the city a few decades ago from particular huge nurseries in the Fraser Valley. And they used to supply most of Western Canada and parts of the Pacific Northwest U.S. with uh, stock for um, growing uh, for, for urban street trees. And then California got the sudden oak death, and there is a quarantine on trees and shrubs from Northern California, which prior to um, sudden oak death was the North American biggest supplier of urban planting material. And now much of that slack has been taken up by the nurseries in the Fraser Valley where the Amanita phylloides grow. <laughs> so the very end where the city bought their, you know, the same nurseries are exporting apparently all across the U.S. now and across Canada. So I'm sure that Edmonton, Calgary and other Alberta cities are also planting certain trees, especially things, certain trees that can support Amanita for woodlands. So she learned to identify it and keep an eye out for it. And it's great to be able to document this. And I make an effort, I try and got the word out to all the BC um, mushroom club people and mycology people to keep documenting this. Always preserve specimens when they find it, record the tree species. And someday I hope to 
do a bunch of research, uh, dig into the um, city's archives to find out if their actual lot numbers extend for the particular nursery shipments. And, um, and then other things, Gallerina, Autumn, Alice, or Marginata. And I just noticed a couple on the tables. We have one nice cyclopeptide containing mushroom here, and then there's some Lepiota area on the table. So that's another juicy one if, if you, you know, if anybody here is sick of their liver and wants to give it a whirl. <laughs> Paul? Yeah. Uh, what's the size of those there? Because I'm just looking at Oh, they're far tiny. Off. They're oh, just, okay. they're little brown mushrooms. Yeah. Yeah. But they, they can grow with honeycombs. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and they also can grow mixed in with magic mushrooms. And uh, so it's, uh, when you're dealing with any sort of little brown mushroom, you're dealing with a pretty dangerous bunch. And the honey mushrooms, and there's also some people eat the Cuneromyces mutabilis, which uh, is a little brown mushroom that grows in clusters on wood. So there's always potential for it. But so here's the Canosomy of the little ring. It's rather startling because the genus Canosomy also contains hallucinogenic species. So uh, here we've got deadly and psychoactive occurring in the same genus. And then, Lepiota subincarnata is a classic little tiny lepiota that grows quite often in urban areas and in woodland, just out of twiggy duff and little, you know, tree, tree crap. And um, this is notable because we had a fatality in Vancouver. A man ate an omelette prepared from what he thought were fairy ring mushrooms from his backyard. And for years, he'd been eating these little mushrooms that grew in rings in his backyard. And uh, one time he ate the bunch and got the classic uh, cyclopeptide poisoning, died after a couple of weeks. And it turned out that he had all sorts of these lepiosa and incarnata growing in his backyard. And there's uh, several of these little tiny lepiotas that are dead. Well, we had a case uh, a couple of years ago in Chicago, a person was um, ate these from under her spruce tree in the front yard. Oh, yeah. So it's not just a back Oh, and that's something which I'd like to point out. There's really dumb, bizarre things if you start consulting on poisoning, so you run into some really odd things. And I have also um, a sort of point person for people to call or send emails to, uh, which has general inquiries, can I eat this? For some reason, people always are contacting me, asking me if they can eat these things that are growing in their yard. And I said, well, why do you want to eat them? <laughs> well, because they're growing in my yard. <laughs> well, do you have a cat in your yard? <laughs> or do you have uh, rose bushes in your yard? <laughs> you know, do you want to eat those? You know, for some reason, people, when they find mushrooms growing in their yard, the first thing, oh, I wonder if I can eat these. <laughs> Because it's free food. Yes. I guess so. Oh, no, this um, person uh, survived with a liver transplant. Oh, yeah. And the doctor asked her, and it turns out um, the person had been eating any mushrooms that were, she found in the yard. Oh, Jesus. Wow. You can see Darwin had a comment. And did they offer her treatment? Well, she had a liver transplant. Oh, that's okay. Well, that's generous. So she survived. <laughs> 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 uh, it's uh, apparently a rare uh, operation these days. Yeah. What they do now is uh, p piggyback liver transplants, and they just transplant a lobe. They take a lobe from a donor, quite often a living donor, and not, not necessarily cadaveric. But, um, and then they'll just tie it into the patient's um, abdomen. They, they wire tube it into to his bile and hepatic drainage system and then they're quite often sometimes they leave the diseased liver in or they remove portions of it or the whole thing and then eventually this lobe of liver will begin to regenerate and produce more and more liver tissue and eventually becomes a self-supporting I don't even know if they have to continue uh, uh, immune suppression after certain points but anyway is she still eating mushrooms from her yard? Uh, I haven't started anything to follow up. She's good to solve. Oh, no. But we, I, I also handle poison center calls, like a lot of us across the country. And the, the adults are the ones that get in trouble. 
Yeah. Because they purposely eat mushrooms, they don't yeah. know what they are. Yeah. Or like in another case, they ate morels raw. As the kids yeah. are out, you know, putting things in their mouth, and usually they don't ingest anything. Yeah. And it's a random process, yeah, and random. the chances of encountering a deadly thing by random isn't that much. Well, that's something there are tens of thousands of species of mushrooms. There's a handful of really good, worthwhile edibles, and there's a relative handful of really dangerous mushrooms. So, um, unfortunately, a lot of the really dangerous ones are quite attractive looking to us. Um, okay, and then this very scary renal toxic uh, orolanin grows, exists in the, this group of Cortinarius called Leprosity. Which, um, and we don't know how widespread this is. This is one with a latency period of up to three weeks. And um, it, uh, we know about the poisonousness of this mushroom uh, thanks to the uh, military training in a couple of countries. In Britain and in Poland, there were cases of army survival exercises. And in the Scottish case, a whole bunch of soldiers from all over the British Isles went to this one area and they did these survival training routines. And one of the things they did was gather edible mushrooms and make a big stew of it and they ate it. And then they went off to their separate bases around, the, around Great Britain, began to drop from kidney failure a long time after the exercise. But eventually they were able to track down um, all of these cases to the common experience of the survival training and they went through all the possible exposures because there's lots of chemical compounds uh, man-made chemical compounds that can cause these types of kidney failures and the common thing was this mushroom meal that they all ate a eerily similar thing happened in Poland and simply because of these masses of people that um, ate the same meal that we know that these things are poisonous. It could have to this, but had it been for those two incidents, we might not have known that this happens. Uh, gyromitra uh, contain the gyromitra, a volatile uh, monomethyl hydrazine, and various other hydrazines. Uh, hydrazines are very scary. They're apparently used in research to induce tumor growth in rats. And um, there is an incident where there have been, over the years, scattered very puzzling accounts of poisonings, fairly distinct symptomology and um, clinical signs. And uh, there had been an incident in the U.S. and California, and a physician had consulted on this, and he casually mentioned the case to an associate of his who worked in environmental health. And um, he, this associate had uh, dealt with uh, mass poisoning on a workplace, uh, Los, a Los Alamos Jet Propulsion Labs, Pasadena. And several of the employees working on a new group of compounds have come out with a very serious, very distinctive and serious form of uh, organ destruction illness. And uh, they've been tracked down to what they thought was a synthesized compound called monomethyl hydrazine. And so the two physicians compared, you know, they, they, when they asked around, they soon got reports of other incidents of mushroom poisoning that appeared to resemble this monomethyl hydrazine poisoning. So they went ahead and they managed to obtain a bunch of the uh, gyromitras and analyzed them and found that they do indeed contain monomethyl hydrazine and other hydrazine rocket fuels. And there have been cases where a chef prepared a meal or people worked in a canning factory, canning gyromitras, and the chef or the cook or the uh, people working in the canning plant got really sick with the classic gyromitra symptoms, monomethyl hydrazine. Uh, but the people that ate the cooked material didn't get sick. And it's because the volatile fumes were driven off during the cooking and were inhaled by the workers. <laughs> hmm. And it's not recommended that any of these gyromitras, helvellas, a lot of the cup fungi now are highly suspect. And so it's not recommended. That, in some country, of Finland is infamous. The Finns are nuts and they still eat lots and lots of gyromitras. <laughs> but either way, most other countries have banned them for consumption. I have a Finnish mushroom book. 
um, that, has a, that has symbols for edibility, and the gyromitra esculenta has three daggers, three stars, and three question marks. <laughs> <laughs> Cabritus uh, atramentarius and some other ink caps contain compounds of co co uh, coprene, and it's uh, chemically quite similar to antibuse or disulfiram. And antibuse is something that blocks the uh, body's production of certain enzymes involved in the breakdown of alcohol. So when you drink alcohol, it goes through a succession of breakdowns and eventually becomes glucose. But if you break that chain, of uh, enzymes working on the alcohol molecule. It can be left in uh, uh, aldehydes or other different toxic um, compounds that are in that chain. But usually the body immediately breaks it down as soon as these things are formed, but they accumulate if you've eaten the uh, inky cat mushrooms and drank alcohol. So the alcohol is stopped halfway through the breakdown process. So you get toxicity from that. Is that the only inky cat that does that? There? No, no. It's been uh, suspected a couple of other types of mushrooms that are caprinus might do that. And now it looks like uh, it, the taxonomy of the inky caps is very complicated. Now there's looks like there's several species that we used to call atramentarians. And so I think if we were to systematically uh, meat and have a wine and caprinus party, we could probably sort out <laughs> how many of these species. We could have groups of people eating different species of caprinus and swimming wine and find out. But I wouldn't be surprised if there aren't several mushrooms where this occurs. Oh, oh, and then there's muscarine, uh, jewel sweat and tears, as um, Clyde calls it. The muscarine was first found in Amanita muscaria. But it turns out it wasn't the toxin, primary toxin in Amanita muscaria, but it bears the name muscarine from muscaria. But it was found in much higher concentrations in different uh, other mushrooms, including Clytosity and Inosity. And so you should learn to identify and avoid these genera that have muscarine. And, uh, That's another one that used to be listed as Amanita muscaria, but it's Lots of different Inosity species contain uh, muscarine. And now, here's a case study. I was um, contacted after May 23rd, 2011. Two year old Chihuahua died and was seen eating mushrooms, and the owners um, collected some and submitted them for identification. And I was able to um, identify them as being inoxidy mixed tillus. This is a known muscarine containing inoxidy species. And in a case like this, I photographed the mushrooms. And one of the characters of mixed tillus is it has a little bulbous base with a little rim around it. And as usual, when you have people that aren't into mycology, they just grab them out of the lawn. But I was very fortunate that a little bit of the base there showed this little rim that's characteristic of the inosibes that have a bulbous base. And then a microscopic examination showed very characteristic crystal cap thick walled cystidia, which many inosibes have in the shape and characters of this particular one, combined with the spores, which are very nodulose. They're very, they look like little piggy banks or something. All the big knobs sticking out of them. And um, so that was able to get me to the um, uh, inosophy mixed to this thing. So that's an example of what happens in an investigation. So the magic mushrooms are two types, uh, three types, kind of. Um, Ibotenic acid and muscimol are a particular group of compounds. Uh, type of compounds that are delirium. They're not a true hallucinogen and you don't have a fully conscious sort of swirly image filled thing, but it's more of going into a twilight sleep and having weird dreams. It's very euphorian to delirium. And, um, it's uh, ibotenic acid occurs in the fresh mushroom and it's not very active at all. In fact, you can eat a bushel of Amanita muscaria 
in some areas and you won't feel anything but bloating, but if they're dried out or cooked or uh, altered in certain ways, uh, the ibotenic acid breaks down into muscimol with the loss of water and dehydroxylization uh, results in a muscimol which is psychoactive. And, um, and then that uh, causes a sort of delirium state. And it's a beautiful, it's a wonderful class of mushroom. Different color varieties. <laughs> and Amanita pantherina has the same toxins, same properties, but many times more the concentration of the compounds in it, and it's quite dangerous. We did have one death on Vancouver Island, a 17-year-old youth who ate a whole bunch of Amanita pantherinas and partied and drank a lot of alcohol and ate junk food, and then he, he died asphyxiating on his vomit after he'd uh, become unconscious. And, um, the coroner's uh, report um, put his primary cause alcohol poisoning, and secondary was Amanita pantherina poisoning, causing asphyxia. Um, and, um, then there's the classic true hallucinogenic psilocybin intoxication, which is associated with colorful visions. I've uh, been a fairly alert and conscious state throughout the experience as opposed to these dreamy dream states or the twilight sleep uh, deliriums. Oh, by the way, the Amanita muscaria pantherina intoxication sometimes result in convulsions and very delirious thrashing around is a pretty bizarre behavior. Anecdotally, I tracked down when I was at certain conferences years ago where there was a predominance of psychoactive enthusiasm. <laughs> I used to get any chance where people would start talking about Amanita experiences, I'd start plugging them for information and figured out that caffeine and other stimulants is definitely contraindicated with these delirium type things because they're antagonistic to the delirium sort of sleepy time effects of them, and that's all the people I talked to that went through convulsive periods and thrashed around and had these really bizarre episodes. They always had some type of stimulant, whether it's tea, coffee, soda, drinks with caffeine, chocolate, so something to be aware of. Um, psilocybin and psilocin, they're found in various wild mushrooms and they became black market items. Yeah. And the primary um, causes of problems here, it's psychological. And there used to be a lot of scare about drugs driving people mad, but there's a meta study done of um, the psychiatric admissions before and after hallucinogens hit, in this case, North America. I think they included Europe in the meta study too. What they found was that the admission rates per capita of the population were constant before and after for the clearly identifiable things like schizophrenia, you know, various psychoses, all these really clear uh, psychiatric conditions. But the age of admission uh, upon the time of the introduction of psychedelics grew younger. So a lot of the, it triggered the prevalence of hallucinogens prep, uh, triggered latent pre-existing psychiatric conditions that probably would have emerged later on in life. So it's always in one of the big uh, issues with legalization of these is uh, being cautious who has access to them because it's something that, anyway, I will go on about that. Um, so we have uh, the um, different thing to paniolus, like the subaltiatus that can contain psilocybin psilocin. Really likes old horse manure, by the way, like old stable yards that are all leached out and degraded. Straw and manure. Gymnopolis luteofolius is another psilocybin containing mushroom. And then there's another group of hallucinogenic fungi, and I just throw them in here on the psychedelics theme because it's ergot that grows a parasite on grasses, and it produces the source compounds that LSD was made from. So lysergic acids are found in these ergot, and that's um, 
He was responsible for epidemics of madness at one point, and it's believed that the great fear in um, France that led to, there was a couple days of what they call the great fear that led to the revolution of France. It's thought that a river was heavily contaminated with her god was brought in and because of the famine at the time a lot of peasants ate it and that, that a lot of them rushed through Paris with farm implements and overthrew the Bastille but also oddly enough ways away from Paris peasants were running into the woods and to the forest howling and screaming too. So it's thought that that was an ergot over it. Anyway, you go on. And this is LSD, the synthetic compound that was derived from and then we, here we have a bunch of GI upsets and miscellaneous things. Hevelomas, uh, they're common name, poison pie. A lot of hevelomas have pretty nasty compounds that cause a good GI workout. Which is fairly, not, not fatal, but quite often people sort of wish it was. And it may be, uh, the idea of being aware of where you pick mushrooms, um, a lot of the hevelomas are corpse mushrooms. They like to grow on... Uh, where animal remains have rotted into the ground. So, um, corpse finders. So, here's a case where you could probably both get the toxins of Hebeloma and some nasty bacteria from a deer bird. You always pick mushrooms in pristine habitat. Uh, Lactarius olivaceo umbrinus is an ugly, warty, toad like thing that uh, is poisonous, causes gastrointestinal. Discomfort, but it's also neat because if you spray a base like ammonia or KOH on it, it turns magenta. Oh, wow. It's sort of a neat thing. And various vicarious probiculatus is supposed to cause gastrointestinal problems. Gelatinous based rumerians are linked to gastrointestinal. We have some here, I think. Yeah. yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, one piece anyway. Okay, enough to fry up. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think you liked mushrooms, Paul. I don't. Yeah, this is why. There's some things that are not the mushrooms themselves, but still toxins. And an example is this blackish mold that grows on coral fungi. It contains some really nasty um, uh, tumorigenic uh, nasty compounds. That, um, so, and it's a bit scary because at the initial stage of infection, it can be hard to pick up on this very faint grayishness. It eventually becomes black and hairy. It's pretty evident that the mushrooms contaminate. And um, Amanita Franchetti, which just recently claimed to have caused several deaths in Qingqi province, Japan, uh, China, sorry. And, uh, Symptoms were gastrointestinal with fairly rapid ontake, um, yeah, 2 to 15 hours, with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, general aching, abdominal uh, distension, pain, and dizziness. And then um, it would resolve itself, and then after a week or so, there was massive, uh, oh, I think it was heart failure, and they couldn't quite figure out why the heart went to bluey, but it was. Uh, it hasn't been fully explained in the paper, claiming this had some real problems of translation and editing, so it's not quite sure um, what was going on there. They believed that they were eating Amanita rubescens, which is as good as a mushroom picture here. And it was a mushroom of commerce in markets there, and then now it's being banned. But what they had was apparently Amanita franchetti that caused these severe symptoms. Very distinct and very pretty mushroom. Is there a story about mycologist? Is it related to that? No, no, that was Amanita Smith. That turned out to be Amanita smithiana is mistaken for pine mushroom, causes kidney failure. And um, in October, 26, 2011, 63 year old male in a suit made from his wild mushrooms and he believed them to be um, pine mushroom. He made a suit out of several types of mushrooms and puffballs, meadow mushrooms, the prints, and what he thought were pine mushrooms. And um, 
here's the recipe. Boiled them in water, onions, garlic, and cream were added. Four hours after eating the soup, he, he became ill. Twenty hours after he developed kidney failure, was hospitalized for two weeks, got dialysis. Uh, so that, I can't remember how many sessions over nine days. He had a few sessions of dialysis. And the soup was submitted to me for identification, so I was able to pick through the soup, and I picked out the pieces of mushrooms and divided them up by characteristics, uh, gross morphological characteristics, and did microscopy. Found several pieces of Amanita uh, smithiana in there. And I was able to identify the spores were uh, amyloid, turning bluish in iodine solution in a particular shape and size. And um, so I was able to pick out the pieces of amanita from the various other bits in the soup. And, um, and these were submitted to a lab in. Uh, Innsbruck, Austria, had its working on Amanita smithiana poisoning, and they did paper chromatography <clears throat> on uh, using the soup liquid from the soup sample, uh, the isolated fragments of the Amanita smithiana from the soup that they picked out of the soup, and uh, this was a voucher sample of Amanita smithiana. Then this was a negative control, which was Amanita phylloides death cap soup, which was made with Amanita phylloides, a non-poisonous mushroom, the Boletus or Xerochromus fatius, onion, celery, pepper, salt, meat, and cream. Yum. And then it was spotted on the paper and it ran. And this red blotch here and the orange is the Amanita smithiana toxin, and that's lacking from the deadly Amanita uh, phylloidy soup. And, uh, and this, what this shows that is kind of scary is there's a very high value of the toxin in the broth portion of the soup. So when you cook up a mushroom dish, if you change your mind, just picking the mushroom out of the dish may not cut it. You know, the toxin may have diffused through the rest of the dish. Oh, the uh, victim of that poisoning survived, and he was very cooperative and you know, helped out a lot with it. Well, I said when people used to drink a lot in the old days, um, you never should mix your drinks. So, oh, no, yeah. it seems like you never should mix your mushrooms. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's really nice not to uh, do a whole hodgepodge, because we get poisoning cases where we look at a sample of the food or stomach contents, and it's just like... A, just, it's like a display foray table or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, who do you blame? I mean, we don't know what combinations of things might do. <laughs> you know? Okay, Paxillus involutus and other involutus and other uh, Paxillus uh, cause this autoimmune uh, hemolytic anemia. And um, this is the one that killed a professional mycologist. There is a Schaefer or no, not Schaefer. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I think R.L. Schaefer, Schaefer. There's a couple of different, very close spellings of, of European. It was a Czech mycologist who, um, and he um, had apparently been interred in a Nazi uh, prisoner of war camp or concentration camp in a con, uh, the end of the war, liberation. He was liberated and. Uh, with chronic food shortages, he went out being a mycologist and gathered a huge whack of Paxillus involutus and ate them and died. And he apparently um, was in extremely bad shape already, dehydrated and starved from his period in imprisonment. So it was just the final straw. But that's the only professional mycologist, to my understanding, who died of mushroom poisoning. Otherwise, it's been hushed. <laughs> well, obvious, obvious misidentification. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And um, well, at the time, Paxillus was considered to be edible. Oh, yeah, it wasn't known to be toxic. And that's a lot of these are just recent. Huh? 
I have an old book that lists, lists the government, oh, yeah. government of Canada publications. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The old BC handbook, uh, unfortunately, referred to it as the Brown Chanterelle. Some people seem able to do. We think that there might be more than one species that are being confused. Might be uh, we're not quite sure what's going on there. Part of it, I think, part what they thought it was over there is that, that the consistent eating of it is just you can eat a little bit of it, oh, but yeah. you know it's kind of like gyro too. You just yeah. get that one level and, and, uh, and it does the end. And also age and how healthy your own oh, yeah. liver is. Yeah. So those combinations. Yeah. There is, by the way, the Czechs are a bit nuts as a people when it comes to mushrooms. Like many European people, they have funny attitudes. And there is a Czech mycologist who wrote a paper, and I think with Czeska Mycologic, about uh, poisoning by edible mushrooms. And he described how he'd been eating these mushrooms for years, and then he went out and gathered a bunch and cooked them up, ate them, and got sick. And it turned out that he had been had a loving and devoted wife who they'd been together ever since they were married, and this was a decades and decades before. And he was always going out and making up big boxes of mushrooms, bringing them back, and she'd diligently throw out the poisonous ones and cook up the edible ones. And then for the first time in their marriage, she went off to visit family, and he went out gathered a whole bunch of mushrooms brought them home, cooked them up, and ate them. And then when his wife got back, uh, and he told her that he'd written and submitted this uh, little article for the mycological journal, she explained to him, that, oh no, dear, I've been throwing those out all the time. <laughs> Darkly blue staining bull beets are supposed to be poisonous. Daniel Winkler has been now systematically eating red poured bull beets because he, when he visits Germany, he finds a lot of his friends and family have always been eating these red poured bull beets and really like them. So he's been trying them and apparently he's had great success gobbling down Boletus satanus with a terrible effect. So as I, Boletus diabolicus. <laughs> is that the same thing as this? Yeah, we've got, this is one of our North American red tube Boletes. Oh. I think he tried this one and said it was very tasty. And again, he said he didn't get any symptoms. Are they just this, uh, GI symptoms or do they affect? Yeah, GI symptoms. Apparently very severe. There have been deaths uh, uh, attributed to the severe dehydration and, and intestinal bleeding. The vigorousness of the GI event. So, uh, the, we don't know. Antiloma lividum, a lot of the antilomas are infamous for being gastrointestinal poison. Certain trichomas, especially cardinum, is uh, known to be. I think this is the one that causes explosive black, stenchy diarrhea that apparently is very unpleasant. <laughs> Memorable, apparently, because it's rather vividly described by those that deal with <laughs> Scleroderma citrinum. The sclerodermas are highly suspect of all being uh, toxic, causing gastrointestinal upset. Is that a pump ball? That's an earth ball. Oh. They're really tough, and they have purple, dark colored leave it even when they're young. So that's one reason we cut puffballs in half to make sure that they're white inside. Because mm -hmm. there are these dark uh, centered uh, false puffballs or earth balls. And there's rather disturbing reports that in uh, products from China that were labeled black truffles were actually these things <laughs> canned with truffle oil. Uh, poisonous Agaricus smell like creosote or certain chemically and stain instantly dark yellow at the base. And there's several of them. G. 
genus Agaricus are rather difficult to identify. And then there's these are the edible mushroom poisonings. Um, and these are just a few of the mushrooms that have been considered edible. This is the angel wings or Chlorocybella porogens that the elderly Japanese kidney patients who were on dialysis suffered uh, um, encephalopathy from brain, uh, brain, what we used to call brain fever. How do you figure that out though? The people have been eating them safely for years and years and years, and then there's this one report. Yeah, um, how, do you, how do you explain that? It was apparently a tremendous year for these growing chickens. And we have lots of reports from Japan of weird mushroom poisonings. I think because of the population of Japan and the fondness for mushrooms. If they have a big bumper year for something, people will go up and they won't just eat a few. I think they, you know, there's sort of this real take advantage of the situation mentality. And that probably this affected all the patients who were receiving dialysis in treatment for kidney disease. And obviously this wouldn't, if, that, if it's linked to the dialysis, then it wouldn't have shown up before dialysis became a routine. Sort of thing. If it's, yeah. Does it, can it be confused with um, oysters? Yeah, they, these grow on conifer wood rather than broadleaf wood, and they're very delicate and thin. And they're quite nice. They're supposed to be quite tasty for those that like to eat mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then there is uh, something that's very similar to angel wings that turned out very scary. Is this? Uh, Trogia veninata turns out to be an undescribed species and caused lots of deaths, attributed to 400 uh, deaths in um, Yunnan province, China. It was some kind of regional delicacy. And um, the sudden unexplained deaths, and it's really murky. The uh, story behind this is very murky, like many of these reports coming from China. Uh, the, information is not necessarily very well. Well, it, it may be problems of translation. It may be um, um, a, a whole different reporting thing there. I don't know. It's very hard to rely on, on the data. It's not data as we know it. It's presented. So. I like that. Sud syndrome, S-U-D, sudden unexplained death. Huh? Okay, that covers a lot of ground. Talk about covering your butt. Um, Legiparous conifera cola, or Legiparous sulfurius, a chicken of the woods, causes gastrointestinal upset fairly regularly if people eat them undercooked, if they eat them when they're over mature. If they eat too much of them, if they eat them growing from certain trees like redwood or eucalyptus or cedar or yew or certain other trees. And um, we had a case in Vancouver of a six year old girl who ate a piece raw about the size of a loony or so. And she had several hours of vivid hallucinations of monsters in yellow, orange, and red chasing her around and she was reported as climbing up her mother's leg and behaving very strangely. And she was monitored and she showed uh, EEG, looked like she was having a bit of a wild dreamy flurry of some sort and she had all these hallucinations and then uh, she recovered spontaneously. I think they just gave her a bit of a tranquilizer, put her in a quiet space and she mellowed down eventually. And then investigation uh, showed that the family were um, very not, they, they, they appeared not to have any recreational drugs around the home or in the yard. They didn't have pharmaceuticals in the house. They didn't have toxic cleaning products or generally sort of health conscious, very clean living people. So the only explanation was that the girl had been seen eating the mushroom by a sibling. And then I was given the fruity body with this chunk missing out of it to identify. And so it appears that for some reason this uh, raw sulfur mushroom produced hallucinosis in a young child. And that's... Uh, and in Trichloma equestrae, there were cases in France where um, there are these bump 
popular crops, lots and lots of people were eating them several times a day for several days, and they developed rhabdomyolysis, which begins this wasting of the smooth of the muscle tissue. And then you get a lot of breakdown products from the proteins and such from the Is that man on horseback? Yes, okay. that's right. Yeah. Equestria or, or flavobiums. And then uh, it swamps out the kidneys and usually the cause of death or uh, morbidity is the um, a kidney failure caused by it being swamped out by overwhelmed by all these toxic byproducts of muscle breakdown. Well, why do they call it man on horseback? Uh, equestre means man on I think because it grows in pastures and fields and in England or, or some somebody was feeling whimsical and good. <laughs> <laughs> the French call it the Chevalier and it might have come from France. Yeah. Maurice, yes, from where? Mm -hmm. He said it's called Chevalier, why? I'm not sure why. Oh, no, but. No, did Maurice eat them? Graciolinac sub Niger cans causes very similar syndromes. This is something that people in Japan and Taiwan were eating, and there's several cases of rhabdomyolysis resulting in kidney failure there. Too. And so we, we we're looking at pictures emerging of not being very safe to experiment. Then just recently, it's been realized cruising over North American and European poisoning reports that Lexinum is frequently implicated in gastrointestinal problems. And um, it's being reported all over North America. And myself, I used to eat a lot of Lexinum, so I began to get gastrointestinal upset. And uh, queasiness, and I turn white as it goes, and start sweating, and chilly, and uh, it just looked like death warmed over. And then after a few hours, it would pass. Sometimes I'd get nauseated and vomit. And, um, I avoided all bullets cooked from the fresh state. It never happened when I ate dried bullets that being reconstituted just with freshly cooked ones. And so it looks like that science may not be a group that you can blanket and say they are all edible and we'll have to do a lot more work to figure out which ones are causing problems because usually it's just a rantiac or a scaver or one of these people who are just assuming they're very familiar with them. Maybe certain like cyanums out there that are problematic. And then shiitake causes um, what's called um, uh, flagellate erythema, erythema. And this is when people eat a lot of them raw or undercooked, lightly cooked, from the fresh state, freshly, uh, you know, still fresh ones cooked up lightly. And this, uh, especially, they realize suddenly. Um, that this was a real issue when they were doing a study of a whole bunch of medical uh, with a page of study uh, individuals were being studied where they all had some medical condition and they were being fed fresh shiitake to monitor their particular, I can't remember which condition was being studied, but a certain number of them got this very dramatic looking red rash with little streaks on the back. And it's not caused by scratching or anything. It's just the, this rash appears in streaks. And um, it uh, is linked now to these um, fresh shiitake. And by the way, I, was, I looked up uh, flagellate erythrema to see what other things could cause it. I seem to recall one of the things that occurs in a deep, severe dehydration. as I think of as a heat stroke and, and so something kind of weird. I think you're still stealing it. I try not to. Um, yeah. So um, this is something, med medical mushrooms are really a hot item now. And people sometimes get carried away and a bit goofy with the medical mushrooms and they expect miracles from there's some rather startling an incident in Japan, some incidents where patients, cancer patients, who are undergoing uh, chemotherapy um, 
had heard about Agaricus Blasii supposedly being the magic wonder bullet for certain cancers. So without telling their uh, regular physicians, they're consuming huge dosages of these Agaricus Blasii and experience liver failure and were hospitalized and then it came out that they were taking these Agaricus Blasii. It turned out that there were several incidents of this. And there was even one woman who um, had um, undergone, the, she was doing the chemotherapy, then she started dosing on all these Agaricus Blasii and then she had the liver failure. She was put in the hospital and they managed to uh, they had to break off the chemotherapy and they managed to nurse her back into health and the liver function resumed and then she was able to undergo a round of chemo again and then she apparently went through a period of remission and then she had another manifestation and so she had went, underwent a second round of chemotherapy and she started super dosing on the agaricus again. <laughs> she had liver failure, hospitalized and died from the uh, liver failure oh, and combined with the... Uh, selling it commercially in bottles? Yeah, yeah. And so when, when you hear these claims for the various mushrooms and things, remember that they're not magic bullets. And I like to urge people when they're like Roger, uh, Robert and I and some others did a panel discussion to all your right, and we all agreed that people are most ideally would be incorporating these into parts, uh, into their diet and their lifestyle and making them a part instead of the wholeheartedly leaping in and worshiping at the reishi uh, capsule you know, booth you use to, you use, yeah, just, yeah, anyway. <laughs> but that isn't what we all agreed on, but anyway, it's a or something like that, yeah. And morels. I mentioned that morels are um, poisonous, raw, and there's this great incident of the police chief of Vancouver retiring. And there's the banquet held, all sorts of dignitaries were there, you know, with <laughs> politicians and all the city you know, hobnobs and the wealthy and the influential. What a good work the, group together. Oh, yeah, all oh, yeah, select target, yeah, real target. Yeah, yeah and so the um, chef prepared a they, they all had lots of drinks, and then there is a salad, sort of an Asian-style salad with raw morel shiitakes, um, uh, um, teriyaki, or, uh, soya sauce, ginger, garlic, I have a recipe somewhere, green onions, <laughs> peanut oil, yeah, 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 and um, so the chef had bought uh, fresh morels, hundreds of pounds of fresh morels from an itinerant mushroom picker dealer who showed up at the back door of the restaurant, and he bought these, I think it was 200 pounds, and he put most of them out on trays, big, you know, on those big commercial kitchen cookie trays and had them spread out in the walk-in freezer, and he was freezing them, and then he was going to bag them up and put them into storage for later use, and then he prepared the nice fresh ones for the banquet. And um, they had their salad, and they're waiting for the next dish and having the round of drinks before the next dish. And the first person to get sick was the uh, health officer, the provincial health officer, John Blatherwick, and he did the great race to the uh, porcelain uh, relief valve. <laughs> and then all sorts of other people started dropping like flies. There was, uh, in all, 16% of the people at the banquet, there were 384 or something like that, people guests at the banquet. 16% of them, I think it was 66 of them, experienced symptoms. One person was hospitalized, and that was a man who ate two portions because his wife refused to eat mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine that there were a lot of conversations after that. And I asked John Blatherwick, and I had a conversation with him, I just asked him offhand, I said, do you still eat mushrooms? And he said, coughed. I said, no, no, I think it'll be a long time. And we were talking about, we got together and we were talking about developing a program. This might be something that other clubs would be involved in too. Some kind of basic information pamphlet for chefs, restaurant workers, people in the commercial food trade. With the very basic things about how to select 
fresh quality mushrooms, what to look for to indicate spoilage, how to handle, store them, uh, how to cook them and prepare them safely, etc. How do you think that wild mushrooms should be regulated for sales in, in, in the, the markets? And I like a lot of European models which have a list of commercially approved species. And they have several countries rate them. So they have an A class, a B class, a C class, for example. And um, I think it could be very tricky to put into practice, but it'd be very good if, for example, all people selling morels would have to have on the label, cook before eating, like you do with pork products. Um, if, um, yeah, so, and then, uh, I don't know, it's really hard to deal with issues like contamination. Uh, but there should be courses of training for people who are picking inside commercial. Yeah. Just yeah. like you're right. Yeah. yeah, and we should also have a mechanism here. Most European countries, all pharmacists are trained to identify mushrooms and plants. And so you can go in many countries to the local pharmacist with a basket of mushrooms, and they're trained to identify the ones that are known good edibles. Is that right? Yeah, Switzerland, um, uh, Czech Republic, uh, a, lot most, a lot of European countries have systems. Talk to the pharmaceutical society and get them to smarten up. Yeah, and also in m most European countries, they identify plants because of the prevalence of herbal medicine. So uh, most pharmacists are able to identify the very common uh, you know, herbs used for making teas and the edible weeds and that sort of thing. And it was always. In, in Europe, it's still just considered natural that pharmacists would learn about the origins of drugs, the plant origins of them, so they have to know botany. But our pharmacists now have no training in botany as far as I'm What a backward culture. So anyway, that's the end. Eat me, eat me, said the mushroom. That's always the lure. These little elves are out there just waiting to entrap you. They're, they're gremlin-like. They're very mischievous. And, yeah. Have you heard of any polypores being uh, poisonous? Yeah. Yeah, well, there's the, sulf, the um, chicken of the woods, which causes the gastrointestinal and the hallucinations in the young child. There's um, some, the conks, of course, cause brain damage when they fall on you from a <laughs> <laughs> Hence the name, which is on an Um Now there's... Um, it's poly, polyporic acid. Yeah, polyporic acid in... Uh, the officinalis, the... Uh, no. No. It's one polyporic acid. Yeah, it's one polyporic Oh, phyla of what? Um, Haplopilus. Yes. Okay, yeah. It's a weird thing that, that turns magenta with KOH. Yeah, oh, that's black diamond fungus? Uh, no, no, no. no, it's a soft polyphorus. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. set up a whole row of frying pans and we had a poisonous mushroom tasting session. <laughs> Everybody got a little bucket to spit into and we ate all sorts of different poisonous mushrooms and a lot of them are very tasty and very nice. Uh. <laughs> Excellent. So before we, before we wind up and, and go and do some identification tonight, um, Melanie, do you have any any kudos to give out? Yes, I do. I have John Samuel. Where's John? Here, John. John. No, you're not in trouble. <laughs> Beautiful card, printed out perfectly. You could read every single field. Nice notes. Congratulations, John. 
Anybody have anything else that they need to? Valley, nothing. Well, please. Any I, questions? I have a question. For some of these, are they going to be on a website where we can look these up? No, you got to come to these forums. <laughs> Otherwise, any, you know, any of the vulgar. They find it in the database. Yeah, they get it. Yeah. No, but I meant, I meant this talking call. So we're we're, we're, we're we're developing some stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Martin, if I want new areas to go to tomorrow. Yep. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Actually, if somebody, somebody has their schedule. There's one on the table. Pass it to me. Oh, thanks. Yeah, so tomorrow, O'Hagan Road, there's a couple of beautiful sites on O'Hagan Road, and um, and the West Castle Old Growth, it's going to be actually, there's some beautiful old stuff along the road. There's going to be some campers in there, but there's some Beautiful big big trees, and uh, so we've got some nice stuff happening. So old growth would be like cars. Basically. Yeah, that's actually cars, and uh, and the old Hagen is is both by bus, and the old Hagen is just some beautiful sites there, okay. and I'm really excited about going to those ones. Excellent. Other than that, enjoy, identify some mushrooms, and have some fun. Excellent. Good. We get away earlier. Yeah, we're going to get away a little bit earlier.